the accusative case in German. We're going to be covering everything you will ever need to know about the accusative case. So that would be uh, direct objects, uh, you know, definite articles, indefinite articles, pronouns, uh, Two-way prepositions are actually going to come up in this presentation. Um, and I've got a bunch of stuff that are, uh, that are going to be showing up in this. But uh, without further ado, let's get into the, uh, the actual presentation. Uh, first of all, there's my socials. So if you're looking for my social networks, you can find me on all of those places. They'll be kind of scrolling through at the bottom of the page throughout this. Uh, and then second thing is I will be making some extra materials. I'll give you a copy of this presentation. I'll also give you a worksheet to go with this. Um, and get you some kind of extra materials to go with this. And all you have to do in order to get those is one, if you're my Patreon supporters, you already get this and I'm not making you uh, pay for this at all. So I just want to give a shout out to my Patreon people. Uh, thank you very much for your support throughout the years. And uh, so you get this as just kind of an extra perk of being a Patreon person. Uh, usually those people pay $2 per video, uh, but live lessons are not included in that. So they get this one for free. So. Congratulations to them. Uh, the rest of you can get this relatively easily. All you have to do is uh, send out a $5 or more super chat in the uh, comments down below. Uh, you can just hit the little money sign next to the chat button and uh, send out a super chat. Um, and then that will count as your payment for this. Otherwise, I will be putting a link in the description of this uh, once this is all done and uh, I'll upload those materials to my website where you can now download all kinds of materials that I have. Uh, I've got my shop set up over there so you can get those kind of things. Now, I know that's why you're not, not why you're here. So uh, let's get into what are we talking about today? Uh, first thing is we're going to be talking about the accusative case, obviously. In order to understand that properly, though, we do need to understand what is a grammatical case. Um, so we're going to talk about that. What is a direct object? Because I mentioned before, that's one of the main things that the uh, accusative case is used for. Uh, definite articles, indefinite articles, accusative uh, adjective endings. So those are going to have to be uh, talked about as well. Uh, weak nouns, and what does that even mean? Uh, specific time is one of the other uses of the accusative case. Uh, personal pronouns, reflexive pronouns, but a kind of a simplified version so that you only get the accusative stuff out of this. Uh, accusative prepositions, two-way prepositions, which means they could be accusative, they could be dative. We're going to simplify that for you. And verbs with fixed prepositions, meaning that uh, there are verbs that are commonly used with particular prepositions. I'm going to teach you how to use those when they are used with the accusative case. So, very first thing on here, what is a grammatical case? Uh, if you Google it and you find Wikipedia's definition, their definition is a special grammatical category of a noun, pronoun, adjective, particle, or numeral whose value reflects the grammatical function performed by that word in a phrase, clause, or sentence. That's incredibly complicated and confusing, so rather than do that, I have my own definition of this. Uh, basically, it's a way to identify a noun or the other things that go with it, so the article or the adjective or something else uh, and it identifies what exactly is that thing doing in the sentence. Uh, is this thing the subject of the sentence? Is this uh, being acted upon? Is this being given to someone else? What exactly, uh, what exactly is being done in this sentence? That's the whole point here. So, for instance, the sentence Der Mann gibt dem Jungen einen Lutscher. The man gives the boy a sucker. In this, we have three cases being used. We have the nominative case, which is used for the subject. So that's der Mann. That's in red. Uh, throughout this presentation, I'll be using the same colors over and over again for all of this. So uh, if you see red, that means that it's nominative. If you see uh, green, you mean that that's accusative. And if you see blue, that's dative. Um, obviously, we're going to be focusing on the red and green mostly in this, uh, but uh, there will be a few times that those other colors come up as well. At any rate, der Mann is in red for the subject, uh, blue version there is dem Jungen for the uh, dative case, and einen Lutscher is the accusative case. Because of the German case system, it's grammatically acceptable to move word order around and kind of uh, play around a little bit, make things a little bit more exciting, and uh, not have the same boring subject, verb, other stuff. Um, you can have an uh, indirect object first, which is what happens in the next example. Dem Jungen gibt der Mann einen Lutscher. 
Here we move the indirect object to the beginning of the sentence, meaning that it literally says, the boy gives the man a sucker. But the problem is, in English, if you switch the word order like that, the doesn't identify how it's being used. So we don't really know, and it changes the meaning of the sentence if you move the word order around. In German, the sentence means the same thing, even if you move this thing to the other side. In the last version, einen Lutscher gibt der Mann dem Jungen, it doesn't even make sense in English to put the uh, word order in this order. If you say einen Lutscher first, it would be a sucker. A sucker gives the, the man the boy. It would be the uh, translation if you get, did word for word. And that doesn't work in English, but in German, because of the case system, you can use this kind of word order. So. What is a direct object? This is the main use of the accusative case, or kind of the first thing that most people learn about the accusative case. It's a direct object. According to Google, it's a noun phrase denoting a person or thing that is the recipient of the action of the transitive verb. Okay, sure. That helps if you know what the word denoting and transitive verb mean, but simplified version, this is what's being verbed in the sentence. So what is being acted upon? So, I give you a couple of examples here. Ich werfe den Ball. Ich werfe den Ball. I am throwing the ball. The ball is the thing being acted upon. It's being thrown in this sentence. So that means that this is our direct object. Direct objects in German are accusative. So we have ich in the nominative case, the subject case, and den Ball in the accusative. Er mag dich. He likes you. He is the one that likes something. The something he likes is you, and that means that we have here the accusative case for you, which is why we use dich in this instance. Now, we, uh, we of course, will get to those pronouns here in a little bit as far as like how to use them, why we have dich here instead of ich or something like that. Um, and so once we get to that, we'll get into more details there. But these are some examples of how direct objects are used in German. Direct objects are, again, the thing that is most often taught first when you're learning the accusative case. And uh, here we have the examples of, um, a couple of more examples, basically, of direct objects. We have, der Mann kauft den Traktor. The man is buying the, the tractor. The man is the one purchasing something. The something he is purchasing is the direct object, which is what the tractor is doing in that sentence. So we have the accusative case there. You'll notice that we have der Mann and den Traktor. These articles here tell us what case things are being used in. Das Mädchen liest das Buch. The girl is reading the book. In this sentence, it doesn't actually work with the case system to tell us what the subject is. In this case, we have to rely on word order so that we can figure out which thing is acting upon the other one. Obviously, it's the girl that's reading the book and not the book reading the girl. So, in this case, we do have to rely on word order and not the case system to tell us all of our answers. The first chart you get in this presentation is what we call definite articles. Definite articles are generally translated as the in English, and they identify a specific object, meaning that it's not just any book, but it's the book. It's that particular one. And so these are these words here, der, die, das, and die for the nominative case. This is masculine, feminine, neuter, and plural. So der, die, das, die. Der, die, das, die. Those forms there, they are all the nominative case, uh, and they are used for the subject. Uh, then you have the accusative case, which then goes from der to den. The only change between the nominative case and the accusative case here is the masculine form. Den, die, das, die. In English, we would just say the, 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 the. Now, you'll notice that I highlighted the last letter of all of those words, and that's to give you a mnemonic device. Um, this is just another way to remember what the ending should be and what order they go in. This is uh, Resse and Nessa, or uh, some people say Risi Nisi, uh, but Resse Nessa. Resse Nessa, those are uh, R-E-S-E, -E, Dea D Das D, last letter of all of those, and the accusative case, Dein D Das D Nessa. Okay? Uh, these are the same words that you use for demonstrative pronouns and relative pronouns. If you don't know what relative pronouns are or demonstrative pronouns are, they're these words. They're exactly the same words as far as like they're der and die and das. They're exactly those same words. 
um, but they're used in different ways. So instead of being used in front of a noun, they're used in, pr in place of a noun, which is why they're called pronouns. But more on those here in a second. The, the uh, definite articles, uh, there are words that look like them or act like them, and that's diese, jede, manche, solche, welche, and alle. These all serve a similar function as the definite articles, but they don't quite mean the. So diese means this or these or those. Uh, jede is every. Manche is some. Uh, solche is such or this kind of. Welche is which. Alle is all. And so these things obviously are not the, but they serve a similar function. They show you identifying exactly which thing we're talking about. Um, and they take the same ending for each of these. So in the nominative case, so for the example that I gave you here, dieser, dieser, which has an er at the end. No one's going to say it like that with the enunciation of the er at the end. It's just going to be dieser, dieser. Um, but it has an r at the end. So r-e-s-e, n-e-s-e, -E, same endings as before. Dieser, diese, dieses, dieser, diesen, diese, dieses, diese. So those are the endings that you're going to need for the nominative and accusative cases. Now let's get back to some examples. Here we have, uh, I've broken every one of these examples down so that you have masculine nouns in one sentence, feminine nouns in another sentence, neuter nouns in another sentence, and then femi uh, the plural nouns in the last example. So first example here is der Mann hat den Ball. The man has the ball. The man is in the nominative case, so we use der Mann because it's a masculine noun and it's in the subject case. It's the one that is doing something. Uh, the thing he's doing here is he has something. So we use here der Mann hat den Ball. The man has the ball. The ball is the thing being had, which is why instead of der Ball, which is the normal, like the, uh, the base form of this word, we now use den Ball as it's the direct object of that sentence. Die Frau backt die Torte. Uh, I have there slash backt because uh, a lot of people will say backt nowadays. Um, it is the, the original or the, I don't know, old-fashioned, the uh, older version is backt, uh, but the conjugation of the verb has now kind of evolved into backt. Uh, Duden allows both of these to be uh, acceptable, um, but it does list backt as the first option. So, die Frau backt die Torte. The woman is baking the cake. Die Frau is a feminine noun, so we use die for the uh, nominative case there, the subject of the sentence. She's the one baking something. She's not being baked by the cake. Uh, and then the cake is the thing being acted upon. That's our accusative object there. That's die Torte. It doesn't change from die Torte in the original form to die Torte in the accusative case, uh, and so we just have the same thing. Das Mädchen sagt das Wort. The girl says the word. Das Mädchen is the subject of that sentence. The thing that she is saying, the thing she is acting upon in that sentence, is the direct object. So the word is the thing that she is verbing, the thing that she is saying, and so we use here the accusative case. Die Kinder bauen die Sandburgen. The children build the sandcastles. Die Kinder are the ones that are building something, and so we conjugate our verb to go with them, and we use the nominative case for die Kinder. In the plural form, we don't change anything in the accusative case, so we again have die Sandburgen for the accusative object here, the thing being built, the direct object. Sandburgen, the sand castles. More examples, this time we're using examples uh, with these additional words, those words that have the same endings but aren't necessarily actually definite articles. Um, dieser Mann sieht jeden Film. This man sees every film. You'll notice that we have an ER at the end of dieser to indicate that this is a masculine noun, and we use an EN at the end of the word film, or at the end of the word jeden for the word film, because this film is the thing being seen, and it's every film. And so, of course, we have to use here the EN, it's the accusative case, the thing being seen. It's being acted upon in that sentence. Diese Frau, this woman, weiß jede Antwort. Diese Frau weiß jede Antwort. This woman knows every answer. 
Diza has an E at the end because this is referring to a female object. This, uh, this case, it's not an object, but a person. Frau, which is a woman. So it's a feminine noun. We add an E. Same thing for Antwort, which also is a feminine noun. Jeder Antwort, every answer. So this woman knows every answer. Diese Frau weiß jeder Antwort. Dieses Mädchen lässt dieses Buch zu Hause. This girl leaves this book at home. Dieses Mädchen has an ES at the end of it. The important part is that it ends with an S, which is the, the, uh, the neuter form for this word. So ES is the, uh, the neuter form. And the same thing happens with our accusative object, dieses Buch. It's the thing being left. So dieses Buch, again, has an ES because it's accusative and neuter. Diese Kinder are these children. Diese Kinder finden alle Hinweise. These children find all clues, or all of the clues, that is. Again, nominative case for diese Kinder. These are the ones that are finding something. And alle Hinweise is what they're finding, which is the, uh, the direct object or the accusative thing. Again, both of them end with an E because they are plural nouns. Direct objects, again, these uh, are actually relative pronouns. Relative pronouns are used in relative clauses. Uh, the only difference really between a relative clause and a, a, a demonstrative pronoun, demonstrative pronouns are used in their own sentences, while relative pronouns are attached to the, relative, or to the rest of the sentence uh, to which they refer. So uh, I use the same examples, but I put a relative clause in them. So, Ich sehe den Film, die, den dieser Mann sieht. So, I see the film. Uh, that's the normal sentence. And then, den refers back to the film, which is, uh, in the accusative case, in the clause that it's being used in. And so we have, dieser Mann sieht. Dieser Mann is the nominative case in that particular part of the sentence. And den is the accusative case used in that part of the sentence. So, it's not important that the original version here was used in the accusative case. It happens to be that way, this sentence. But um, if you said the film uh, that the man is seeing is cool or is great, you would have nominative case for der Film at the beginning. And then den dieser Mann sieht ist toll. So the film that this man is seeing is great. Because it's being used in the nominative case at the beginning, you would say der Film. And since it's being used as the accusative case in the relative clause, you use the accusative case, den, dieser Mann sieht. Does that make sense? Ich weiß die Antwort, die diese Frau weiß. I know the answer that this woman knows. I know the answer that this woman knows. That is referring back to the answer. And since it's a feminine noun, we use the feminine article, die. And when we're using this as a relative pronoun in the accusative case, it still is die. Dieses Mädchen, das ich mag, lässt dieses Buch zu Hause. Here you'll notice the example that I, uh, I showed you earlier where you have the nominative case being used for the noun to which the re relative pronoun is referring. So dieses Mädchen is in the nominative case in the main clause. So dieses Mädchen lässt dieses Buch zu Hause. The, this girl leaves this book at home. Das is referring back to that same girl. That's why it's das instead of die or der or any of those other things. But ich is the one that, uh, that likes something or I like something. So ich mag das. I like that. In this case, we're to referring back to the girl. So dieses Mädchen, das ich mag, lässt dieses Buch zu Hause. This girl that I like leaves this book at home. Indefinite articles. Indefinite articles are basically either a or an in English, but uh, as a more general or broad uh, explanation of what they are, uh, they refer to things that are not specific. In other words, definite articles identify exactly which thing we're talking about, whereas uh, indefinite articles refer to something, but not necessarily a specific one. So these words are usually also referred to as ein words because, as you can see, they all have the word ein in them. So nominative case, we have for the masculine, no ending whatsoever. It's just ein. For the feminine, we have eine, which just is an E. And then we have ein for the neuter. In English, you can't say a books. You can't say uh, a trees. It doesn't make any sense because a plural noun and a or an, they don't go together. They don't mesh. 
Uh, same thing happens in German. However, there are other words that we'll get to here in a second. Um, you have, um, there are the other words that uh, require an ending that is exactly the same as the ein words are or as the indefinite articles are. And so for that reason, I put here a, a K in parentheses because keine is kind of the negated version of, uh, of these indefinite articles. And so I put that in there as kind of a placeholder, but just know that if it's plural and you're using a word that kind of acts in the similar function as an ein word, use an E at the end of it. In the accusative case, again, the only one that actually changes is the masculine form, and it goes from ein in the nominative to einen in the accusative. As an example, the rest of the words that I mean uh, that I meant to mention in the previous slide that act as uh, ein words or look exactly the same as far as endings are concerned to these indefinite articles, those would include all of the possessives like mine, my, uh, dein, which is your, sein, which is his, ihr, which is both her and their, and also your if it's the, uh, the formal you, in which case it's capitalized, uh, unsa, which is our, euer, which is your, as in like the, the plural ihr form, um, so if ia has something, that's oya, and kein, which is no, um, basically negating a noun like uh, no books, keine Bücher, or uh, no, uh, no dog, you would say like kein Hund or keinen Hund. The reason I show you this is so that you can see these, uh, these words can all be used in the singular forms as well. It's not reserved just for the plural forms. So we have here mein, meine, mein, meine. That's a uh, nominative case for masculine, feminine, neuter, and plural. The accusative case versions, we would have meinen, meine, mein, meine. And again, the only one that changes here is the masculine accusative form, which is now meinen instead of mein. A few examples using this. Uh, these are all, again, in the same type of uh, phrasing that we had before, where we have uh, all masculine in the first one, all feminine, and then all neuter, and then all plural. So, ein Mann hält einen Hund in der Hand. The man is holding a dog in his hand. Or a man is holding a dog in his hand. Sorry, read what's on the slide. Uh, ein Mann is the nominative case, so it doesn't have an ending on the uh, indefinite article here because of the nominative case. And then, einen Hund is the thing being held. Normally, it would be der Hund for the, like if you look it up in a dictionary, it's a masculine noun. Um, and for the ein word, we add en here because it's the thing being held. So it's the direct object of that sentence. Um, eine Lehrerin unterrichtet eine Klasse. A teacher, female teacher that is, teaches a class. The class is also feminine, so both these feminine objects here have an e at the end of it. The teacher is the one that is teaching something, which means that she's the subject. That's nominative case. And eine Klasse is the thing being taught, which means that uh, we have here the accusative case. Ein Mädchen führt ein Pony. A girl is leading a pony. Um, here we have ein Mädchen, which is a neuter noun, so we have no ending on this word whatsoever. And a pony is also a neuter noun, das Pony, so we have here no ending on that either. Uh, even though the girl is the one leading something, that makes her nominative, and the pony is the thing being led, the accusative object, uh, we don't have an ending here because they're both neuter. For plural nouns, we need an E at the end, so we have meine Kinder bringen ihre, uh, ihre Spielzeuge, my children bring their toys. Um, my children are uh, in the plural, case, uh, plural form here, so we have an E at the end. And I had to use a possessive because, again, you can't say a children. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, but mina acts in a similar, uh, similar situation. Um, it's, a, it's indefinite article-esque, but not quite an indefinite article. Uh, it's a possessive. So there is an E there, and their toys, E is the possessive, and add an E for the uh, formal version, or for the, uh, the plural version of that. More examples with possessives. Sein Vater fragt einen Kellner. His father asks a waiter. Sein Vater is nominative and masculine. It's the one that is asking something, so the subject of the sentence, nominative case. No ending on the, uh, the, uh, the possessive here for that nominative case masculine. 
There is, however, an en at the end of einen for this uh, accusative case, the direct object of the sentence, the one being asked, the one being acted upon. That's the direct object, accusative case, einen Kellner. Eure Mutter stellt eine Frage. Your mother is asking a question, uh, or your mother asks a question. Eure has an E at the end. You may notice on the previous slide where uh, I had these here uh, examples of uh, possessives, it was Euer, E-U-E-R. Now in this example, we have Eure, E-U-R-E. -E. It's not that they switched places, it's that the E that used to be there in the middle is no longer there. Uh, the E now at the end is the one that is showing you that this is a feminine noun that follows. Mutter is a feminine noun, so we use an E at the end. Um, if you're using the possessive oya or unsa, and you're using it with a feminine noun or a plural noun or basically any ending of any kind, um, you are going to get rid of that extra E there in the middle. So, eure Mutter stellt eine Frage. Both of these end in E's because they're feminine nouns. And the first one is nominative. The mother is the one that is asking something, nominative case. And the other one is the thing being asked, which means that that's accusative, the direct object. Unser Kind kennt ein sprechendes Pferd. Our child knows a talking horse. Uh, our child is a neuter noun, so we have here no ending. And a horse is also a neuter noun, so again, no ending. The child is the one that knows something, that's nominative case, and the thing that is being known is the horse, which makes that accusative. Ihre Kinder spielen meine Brettspiele. Their children play my game board, uh, board games, <laughs> game boards. Uh, their children play my board games. Ihre Kinder has an E at the end because it's plural, and meine Kinder, uh, meine Brettspiele also has an E at the end because it's plural. Uh, in the first one, we have the children who are the ones playing something. Uh, the something that they are playing is in the uh, nominative, or the thing that they are playing is in the accusative case. The people playing something are in the nominative case. Now, adjective endings are probably one of the more complicated ideas in the German language. We're going to kind of simplify this down to just the nominative and accusative. Um, so here's the, uh, the versions if you have a uh, definite article, that includes the, uh, the diese, jede, manche, solche, those words that I mentioned before. So definite articles and things that act like definite articles. Um, if you have one of those, they're mostly E's. So in the shape of Oklahoma, that would be the masculine, feminine, and neuter forms in the nominative case, and the accusative forms for feminine and neuter, they all end in E. So der junge Mann, die junge Frau, Das junge Mädchen, die junge Frau, das junge Mädchen. Those all end in E, and that kind of forms the, the shape of Oklahoma, if you're familiar with the state of Oklahoma. If not, it looks like a pan or a pot or something like that. It's got a handle on it and then uh, a deeper part. Uh, the rest of them all end up with E-N at the end of the adjective, uh, which is die jungen uh, Kinder, which has an E-N and die jungen Kinder, which has an en again for the plural form in both nominative and accusative. The accusative masculine is again slightly different than the nominative masculine, and that is den jungen Mann. Again, en at the end of the adjective, as opposed to just uh, an e like the other forms. If you use this same thing with ein words, the, the ending that is usually on the end of the der word kind of shifts over to the adjective. So uh, instead of der junge Mann, we now have that R kind of attaching itself to the, uh, to the adjective, ein junger Mann, ER there. Uh, in the accusative case, it's still EN and EN, so we have einen jungen Mann, EN for both of those in the accusative case. Uh, for the female versions, we have an E for all of them, so we have uh, so we have an E at the end of all of these, so we have eine junge Frau, eine junge Frau, and then we get to the neuter forms, which actually answers uh, Ahmed's uh, question here, which is why is it sprechendes Pferd, which is das. Um, it is das sprechendes Pferd, because it's a, uh, or da, not das sprechendes Pferd, it's ein sprechendes Pferd, because ein is an indefinite article. Indefinite articles then kind of shift the gender identification onto the adjective, which is why we have here an ES at the end of the adjective. So, 
um, instead of having das junge Mädchen, we now have ein junges Mädchen. So here you can see the difference between das junge Mädchen and ein junges Mädchen. Das junge Mädchen, ein junges Mädchen. So this kind of again shifts the gender from der or das onto the adjective. That's why we have an er for nominative masculine and an es for the nominative uh, neuter and the uh, accusative neuter. The plural forms still get an en no matter what. Uh, so we have meine jungen Kinder and meine jungen Kinder for uh, both nominative and accusative. So die jungen Kinder, die jungen Kinder, or meine jungen Kinder, meine jungen Kinder. Again, endings matter. Okay. Here we have some examples of this. It's kind of the same sentences as I had before, except uh, now I have them with adjectives attached to them. And I apologize for the fact that this is not on the same line as the rest of the sentence for some reason. Uh, looks like I forgot to hit enter at some point. Uh, Die sehr junge Mann sieht jeden neuen Film. This curious, uh, neugierige, this uh, curious man uh, sees every new film. Dieser neugierige Mann sieht jeden neuen Film. Again, this uh, curious man is the subject of the sentence. We have an ER at the end of this uh, extra word that kind of acts like a definite article. And then we have an E at the end of the adjective because the, the gender of the noun was already identified through the DSAO, which has an ER at the end. That already identified the uh, gender of the noun, so we don't need to on the adjective. Same thing happens here for the accusative case. We have jeden neuen Film, the thing being seen, that's the direct object, accusative case. And we have an en at the end of both of those for the masculine accusative form. Diese kluge Frau weiß jede schwere Antwort. This smart woman knows every difficult answer. This one again has e's for everything. Diese kluge, jede schwere, all of them have e's at the end because they are feminine. It doesn't matter if it's nominative or accusative, it's still an E. Dieses coole Mädchen lässt diese, uh, dieses alte Buch zu Hause. This cool girl leaves this old book at home. Dieses has an ES at the end because it's a neuter noun, Mädchen, and there's an E at the end of the adjective because this is acting like a uh, definite article, so we don't need to identify the gender through the uh, adjective here. Dieses alte Buch, this old book, is the accusative case. It's a thing being left in this sentence. So we use here uh, an E at the end of the adjective after this uh, thing that acts like a definite article. Diese schlauen Kinder finden alle versteckten Hinweise. These clever children find all the hidden clues. These is again acting like, an, uh, acting like a definite article. So we use here diese schlauen Kinder, uh, with an en at the end of it. And alle versteckten has an e at the end of alle for the plural form and an en for the adjective. These are again nominative for the, thing be, the, the things in this case that are finding something, and the things that are being found are using the accusative case. Now some examples using these uh, possessives or ein words um, or indefinite articles, kind of depends on which uh, example we're looking at, but sein hübscher, sein hübscher Vater fragt einen tollen Kellner. His handsome father is asking a great waiter. Sein doesn't have an ending on it, so it doesn't identify the gender of the noun. So we move the identity of the gender onto the adjective with an ER. So sein hübscher Vater, his handsome father. That ER on there identifies it as a masculine nominative uh, noun. Einen tollen Kellner already identifies the gender through uh, the accusative case with einen. So we have that extra EN there. And uh, we just add EN to the adjective to kind of match that. Eure schöne Mutter stellt eine gute Frage. Your beautiful mother is asking a good question. Eure, again, has an E because it's a feminine noun, and that same E is kind of carried over onto the adjective for schöne. Uh, these are both in the nominative case because they're the one asking something. Eine gute Frage does a similar thing. We have an E at the end of eine because it's a feminine noun, Frage. 
and then we have another e at the end of guta, which kind of just carries over the uh, gender over to the next thing. Unser kleines Kind kennt ein sprechendes Pferd. Our small child knows a talking horse. And this was the example that somebody was asking about earlier. Um, so we have here, unser is our. It has no ending on there, so we need to identify the gender through the, uh, through the adjective before the noun. So we have here an es at the end of the adjective to identify that gender. Same thing happens with ein sprechendes Pferd. We identify the gender through the ending on that adjective, ein sprechendes Pferd. Again, nominative case for the child, because it's the one that knows something. The something that it knows is a horse, which is uh, the accusative case, the, uh, the accusative object or the direct object. Ihre kleinen Kinder spielen meine neuen Brettspiele. Here we have an E at the end of the article already with uh, ihre or meine, these, uh, these possessive words here. They already have an E here, but to avoid the confusion of eure schöne Mutter and ihre kleinen Kinder, since they both have an E at the end of the possessive, we now have to have an extra EN at the end for the plural form so that we can kind of identify which one we're talking about as opposed to having a confusion between feminine and plural. So there's no confusion here because of that extra EN at the end. Something that I think gets overlooked a lot by a lot of teachers about the accusative case are these things that we call weak nouns. And weak nouns are uh, nouns that are masculine nouns that require an N or an EN at the end of any case that is not nominative, which of course includes the accusative case. So there are a bunch of words that have, fall into this category, literally hundreds of words that fall into this category, and it's kind of difficult to really identify exactly what those nouns are. Uh, but once you kind of get a feel for what kind of nouns do this, um, you can then kind of extrapolate into the, uh, the additional information that you might need for that. Uh, so anyway, examples of this, der Neffe. It's a masculine noun, it ends in an E. This is a, a relatively common example. Um, der Neffe is the nephew, and it adds an extra N for whenever it becomes den Neffen in the accusative case. Der Name is also a masculine noun that ends in an E, so we have den Namen in the accusative. Uh, Kunde and Russe and Deutsche and Löwe all fall into this same category of things that end in E and are masculine nouns. Uh, be careful with this rule though, there is at least one very prominent example of an exception to this. Der Käse is not a weak noun, it's the cheese. It is a masculine noun, it does end in E, but it is not a weak noun, so it does not add that extra N for the accusative case. Uh, these other ones here don't actually have an E already on there, so we add an extra E whenever we make them into the plural. So, uh, well, with one exception. Uh, der Held becomes den Helden. Der Fels becomes den Felsen. Der Elefant changes to den Elefanten. Der Bauer and der Herr, on the other hand, and der Nachbar, for that matter, uh, those all add just an N, so den Herrn den Bauern, den Nachbarn. This is actually the, uh, the reason that a lot of people tell me my YouTube channel's name is wrong, is because it should be with Herrn Antrim, with an N at the end of the word Herr. And while it is grammatically true, sure, uh, it's because my name uh, of my YouTube channel is in English that I choose not to use this, because in English we don't differentiate, it's always just Herr um, whenever we're stealing the German word for the English uh, pronunciation. So. Uh, we use Herr without that extra N. Uh, if you go to my YouTube channel and your browser is set in German and your YouTube uh, browsing is also set in German, uh, it'll show up with the German version of my YouTube channel, which is uh, Deutsch lernen mit Herrn Antrim. And the reason that it's spelled with Herrn in that is because the entire thing is in German. So anyway, the point is certain ones will take N, certain ones will take E-N, uh, and these are all things that are uh, nouns that require an extra N in the accusative, dative, and genitive cases. Today, obviously, we're focusing on the accusative, so we're going to go through some examples of that. So, uh, I have two examples for each noun so that we can show them in the nominative case and we can show them in the accusative case. So, sein Name ist cool. His name is cool. 
not like he's actually called cool, but like I like his name and it's, it's a cool name. Um, sein Name ist cool. Notice that there is just Name. It's a singular noun and uh, it's a masculine noun. We don't have an ending on Name. It's just Name. Ich mag seinen Namen. I like his name. In this case, we now have the name as the thing being acted upon as opposed to the thing that is in the previous sentence. And so we have this in the accusative case. We change sein to seinen and we change name to namen because it's a weak noun. Der Bär ist in dem Wald. The bear is in the forest. That's nominative case, der Bär. In the accusative case, for the next example, we go to den Bären because it's a weak noun. Der Jäger schießt den Bären. The hunter shoots the bear. Den Bären, accusative case, requires that extra en at the end of the noun because it's a weak noun. Der Elefant trifft den Löwen. The elephant meets the lion. Notice here it's der Elefant, which will come in handy in the next example, but it is den Löwen, which has an en at the end instead of just an e. Der Löwe trifft den Elefanten. The lion meets the elephant. Here we just switch them so that the lion is the one meeting and the uh, elephant is the one that is being met. And so we now have elefanten with an en at the end because it's accusative. Again, same type of thing that happened to der Löwe when it became den Löwen. So the point here is a weak noun is a noun that requires an n or an en at the end of a uh, at the end of it whenever it's used in the accusative, dative, or genitive cases. In the nominative, they're just der, as in der Löwe, der Elefant, der Bär, der Name. All of those just have their normal endings, but in the accusative, dative, and genitive cases, they require an N or EN. That's what a weak noun is. So, a few rules that you can follow for weak nouns. These weak nouns uh, usually are masculine nouns. Well, all of them are masculine nouns, but they usually end with E. And they're usually people or animals. So, der Neffe, der Junge, der Franzose, der Hase, der Affe. All of those are going to be masculine nouns. They end with an E. And so we add an extra N whenever they're in the accusative, dative, or genitive cases. Um, this is also really helpful if you're looking at like uh, nouns that are basically adjectives, um, where we have the... Uh, like the, the word for Franzose, which is on there, uh, that is a word that is used um, as an adjective of sorts. And so we use an en here for the accusative because of the same rules I just showed you for adjective endings. It's kind of a, a noun version of an adjective. So um, it's showing you that it is a French person um, without actually having the word person in there, if that makes sense. But that's what a lot of these words are going to be. That's why der, uh, der Deutsche, uh, in this example here, der Deutsche is on that list because it's a German person. It's der Deutsche Mann. But instead of saying der Deutsche Mann, we just say der Deutsche. So when it becomes accusative, it becomes den Deutschen because it would be den Deutschen Mann. So a lot of those are uh, adjective versions of nouns or nouns that became adjectives. And so that's, uh, that's why those act like that. Um, Lots of nouns with Latin or Greek endings. For example, things that end in ENT, such as assistant, we have assistenten. Uh, emigrant, which ends in ANT, we have emigranten. Uh, anything that ends in IST, such as capitalist, capitalisten. Uh, things that end in AT, such as diplomat, diplomaten. Uh, things that end in AUT, which is astronaut, um, astronauten. We add EN to the end of that one. and uh, things that end in AD, such as Kamerad, Kamerad, N, with an EN at the end. Uh, and then there are a few single syllable masculine nouns that's kind of a, a really uh, random list, basically. Uh, it's difficult to kind of pin down exactly which single syllable masculine nouns get this EN and which ones don't. Uh, but some examples would include der Bär, which changes to den Bären, uh, der Christ, den Christen, uh, der Mensch, den Menschen. Der Prinz, den Prinzen, and der Na, der, uh, den Naren. All right, next up on the topic, uh, we have specific time.
These are again going to be things that use the accusative case, and specific time is uh, not a non-specific time. I know that sounds really stupid, but specific time is time that is used without a preposition, and this time is... Uh, how do I explain this? So it's not a broad thing that could have been. It's not like, one day I was walking through the forest. That's going to be using the genitive case. But it's like, every day, this morning, um, those ki type of specific times, specific days, specific hours, those kind of things, okay? Now, most of the time, no one cares that it's accusative. It doesn't matter. For instance, heute Morgen, it's accusative, but you don't care. There's no ending to worry about. There's no, uh, there's no article in front of it. Um, things like heute Abend, heute Morgen, um, things like that. Occasionally, though, it does matter. For instance, jeden Tag esse ich Wurst. Every day I eat sausage. If this sentence is here, um, we have jeden Tag, en at the end of it. Uh, it's an adjective. We have that ending there, en, because it's a masculine noun in the accusative case. Uh, Wurst is also in the accusative case there because it's a thing being eaten. That's a direct object, uh, which is why it's green, but it's not actually the thing we're focusing on right now. Jede Nacht schlafe ich sechs Stunden. Every night I sleep six hours. Uh, in this sentence, we have jede Nacht as the accusative thing. It has an E at the end because Nacht is a feminine noun. And it's, it's in the accusative case, so we don't have to worry about like changing things to jede or something like that. Uh, but it is specific time here for jede Nacht, every evening, every night, that is. Uh, Zek Stunden is the direct object there. That's the thing being slept. It's six hours. Um, it's a little bit of a weird sentence, but it's still accusative there, so it's highlighted in green too. Next in Donner's Tag, nee, next in Dean's Tag, spiele ich Fußball. Uh, next Tuesday, I am playing soccer. Uh, next in Dean's Tag here is being used in the accusative because, again, it's a specific Tuesday. Which Tuesday? It's the next one. So it's exactly that one. So we have a specific word here for time. Next in Dean's Tag for the accusative case. Fußball is also accusative, but nobody cares because there's no article attached to it. So Fußball is just Fußball. All right, next up we have personal pronouns. Personal pronouns are pronouns that uh, replace people, and uh, they also replace, uh, you know, objects or other things, but basically it's just a pronoun that replaces a noun. Um, these are people, places, and things that can be replaced by pronouns. You may recognize the nominative case ones. If you're ever conjugating a verb, it's in the same order for at least whenever I conjugate verbs. Um, it's in the same order. Uh, ich, du, er, sie, es, wir, ihr, sie, sie. Now, in the nominative case, these are the subject uh, pronouns. So whenever I am doing something, that's ich. But if I am being acted upon, that makes me me. So ich changes to mich in the accusative case. Du changes to dich in the accusative case. So if you are being acted upon, um, if I don't like you, you are the one that is being disliked and therefore dich instead of du. Uh, er is he. But in the accusative case, even in English, we change this to him. And in German, we say ihn, I-H-N, ihn, for the uh, accusative form. Z and S don't change between nominative and accusative in a similar way that uh, der and uh, that der changed to dein. So we have er changing to ihn. That's an R ending to an N ending. You'll notice that that ending still stays the same. Uh, D and S, or D and Das, don't change in that form, and so the same thing happens to the pronoun that would replace a feminine or neuter noun. There's no change between nominative and accusative, it's just Z and Z, and S and S. Nothing changes. Via, like it does in English, we, whenever we're not the subject of the sentence, we then uh, become something that is being acted upon. That makes us here the direct object, or something like that. That would be uns, us. So if you say, us go to the store, that sounds stupid. So same thing happens in German. We have to change this to we as the subject, or us if we are being acted upon. Ihr is you all and changes to euch in the, uh, the accusative case. And the two other z's don't change. It's just they and them in English, z and z, or you and you in English and z and z. Again, no change there.
Some examples here, uh, I've used all of the nominative case ones on the left and all of the uh, accusative ones here on the right in green. I've used the exact same sentence over and over again so that you kind of get uh, a feel for exactly what I'm using here. Um, but the verb is brauchen, which means to need. And it's, uh, there's a typo on there that should be an S. So du brauchst, that's an ST there. So sorry for that. But du brauchst mich, you need me. Du brauchst mich. Um, du is the one that is uh, needing something. The something that it needs is me, which is mich. Ich brauche dich. I need you. Dich is the accusative thing, the thing being needed, and it's being needed by me. So me in the nominative case is ich, which is I in English. Sie braucht ihn. She needs him. Uh, it could mean uh, she needs it if that it is a masculine noun. So like, let's say that she needs a table. Um, you need, she needs the t table. Sie braucht den Tisch. You would then change that into a pronoun. Sie braucht ihn. She needs it. Uh, but in this case, I translated as him uh, to show you that it's a masculine noun. Sie, uh, it means she in this case, because we can tell by the conjugation that it means she. Er braucht sie. He needs her. Now, technically, we can't actually tell if it's he needs her or he needs uh, it, which would be a feminine noun. So, like, let's say he needs a door. Uh, er braucht sie. Er braucht die Tür. He needs the door. Er braucht sie. He needs it, but feminine noun. Um, it could also be that he needs them or those or something like that. Um, er braucht sie, referring to a plural thing. So let's say he needs a bunch of pens. Er braucht die Kulis. Er braucht sie. He needs them. Same pronoun there for all of those. Wir brauchen euch. We need you. Plural form this time, the ear form in the uh, accusative form. Um, we change from ihr to euch. We need you. Wir brauchen euch. And then the opposite direction, basically the same pronouns but swapped. Ihr braucht uns. You need us. You all need us. And then the last one, sie brauchen sie. They need you. Um, you can switch this around and it's still going to mean the same thing, but it could be you need them if you lowercase the uh, second z. Um, but the point here is that in the accusative case, when it's the direct object, z doesn't change. And that doesn't matter if it's she or the feminine it, or they, or the formal you, all of them are going to use Z for their pronoun in the nominative and accusative cases. No change for those. Now we can move on to accusative question words. Question words are also called interrogative pronouns, and this is uh, important to know the terminology in this case, because interrogative basically just means it asks something, it's a question, something, uh, and pronoun means that it replaces a noun. And the reason that that's important is because when you're using a question word, it's being used in place of the answer to the question. So wer, which means who, is in the nominative case, and it's used to replace the subject of the sentence. Um, if you're using the accusative question word for people, that's vain. And confusingly to a, a lot of Americans who don't have any idea how to use this word, whom is the accusative case. So vain is whom. So if you're replacing the direct object and that direct object is a person and you're replacing it with a question word, that needs to be vain. We'll give you some examples here in a second of what that looks like and how to use it and such. Was is kind of a, a double use one. So you can use this for the nominative case or you can use it for the accusative case. The point is that was is not a person. Was should be used with uh, things, objects, nouns that are not people. Now, some examples. Wer ist das? Who is that? Wer is the subject of that sentence. Das kind of acts as a, uh, a secondary subject or, uh, technically speaking, a predicate nominative, but uh, that's a different topic. Uh, wer is the subject of the sentence, and so I have it highlighted in red. It's a person, so whenever we answer, you could say, Das ist Bob. Bob is the subject of that sentence, and so we use wer for the person there, for the question word. Wer lädt dich ein? Who is inviting you? This is just another example of wer being the subject of the sentence. Dich in this sentence is the thing being invited, the person being invited, and so we use here the accusative case, wen lädst, uh, wer lädt dich ein? Okay? Accusative case for dich in that sentence because wer is your subject. 
Now, reverse the exact same idea. If do is the subject of a sentence, do lädst, if you are using this as a question, you're asking whom are you inviting? Wen lädst du ein? Whom are you inviting? Wen lädst du ein? Uh, there is a comment here that says vain can also be whom, and that is correct. Vain can be whom, but today's presentation is about the accusative case. Uh, vain is the dative one, so if you're asking about the indirect object, uh, that's a topic for a different presentation. Uh, but yes, you are correct. Vain and vain both translate as whom uh, in English. Uh, vain leads du ein. Whom are you inviting? And then the last one, we have an example of the, uh, the word was being used in the nominative case. Was ist das? What is that? Was is the subject of that sentence. And then also being used as the accusative object. Was hast du in der Tasche? What do you have in the bag? You are the one that has something in that sentence, and the something you have is what? That question word is the thing being acted upon, and therefore that's accusative that time. So when you answer this question, what you replace what with, the, the answer to the question, is accusative. So, ich habe einen Kuli in der Tasche. I have a pen in the bag. That's accusative. All right, now let's get some complicated stuff in here. And now we have reflexive pronouns. We just talked about normal pronouns. Um, now we're talking about reflexive pronouns. Um, so the only difference here is, in as far as like the chart is concerned, is it's kind of condensed down because a, z, and s no longer are different things. Instead of being een, z, and s, we now just have one pronoun for the reflexive, which is sich. Same thing happens over here for the z forms. Instead of having z and z, we just have sich. No change whatsoever, it's just sich. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know what a reflexive pronoun is, Basically what happens is, if you have the subject and the direct object as the same thing, the same person, um, you have a reflexive pronoun. Uh, I like to refer to it as having like, the verb is your mirror, and the, both the subject is then being reflected onto the other side of the, uh, the verb, so that is your reflexive object, your reflexive pronoun. Um, and these don't make a whole lot of sense to English speakers because we don't use the reflexive in English. Uh, nearly as often as the German language does. So this is kind of confusing, but we'll get some examples of what that looks like. Um, so anyway. Uh, here are a few examples with these reflexive pronouns. We have ich ärgere mich über mich. I got double points here because I have two reflexives in here, uh, but we'll get to that here in a second. Uh, I am getting angry, uh, but if you try and translate it more literally, it's I am upsetting myself. Um, ich ärgere mich. I am upsetting myself, but I'm upsetting myself at myself, uh, which means that both mich and mich, uh, both of those michs in that sentence are reflexive mich. Now, it doesn't matter to you that they're reflexive, but if you're using this with the er sie form, you would say er ärgert sich über sich, and then it matters that it's reflexive. So that's why we're bringing this up. If you use this for the do form, freust du dich auf das Wochenende? Are you looking forward to the weekend? In English, it's not reflexive. If you want, you can try and force the reflexive in there and put yourself in there, um, which is what dich is doing there. But there isn't a really good translation of how the reflexive is being used here. It's just a required component of this sentence. Freust du dich auf das Wochenende? Are you looking yourself forward to the weekend? Um, again, in English, we're not going to use the reflexive, but in German, we do. 3rd example here, er konzentriert sich auf seine Hausaufgabe. He is concentrating on his homework. Now, sich, again, is not going to be translated whatsoever, uh, so we have to worry about um, how exactly we're going to be translating this. He is concentrating on his homework, is how we would normally say this, but sich is uh, referred to as himself, and so he is concentrating himself on his homework. Um, this is, for no apparent reason in German, reflexive. It doesn't make sense to English speakers that this is a reflexive verb. More examples, we have wir interessieren uns für Fußball. We are interesting ourselves in soccer. 
um, or we are interested in soccer, if you wanted to be like more normal conversation. Uh, but once in there is both the same, uh, is the same persons or people uh, as via are referring to. So via interessieren uns, those things reflect each other. Um, entscheidet ihr euch für eine Universität? Are you interested, uh, are you deciding yourself for a university? Uh, again, we wouldn't use yourself in, uh, in the English, but in German you do. So are you deciding for a university or are you deciding on a university? Um, entscheidet ihr euch für eine Universität? Euch is reflexive there. Sie verlieben, sie verlieben sich. They are falling in love. Because sich here is referring back to the same Z, the same uh, they, we have here in English, we would either say each other or themselves. Um, so they are following each other, uh, they are falling in love with each other or with themselves. Um, sie verlieben sich. That's why sich is there, because it's referring back to the same people for the direct object. All right, let's get into some prepositions, which is probably the, uh, the most requested uh, video that I get as far as video requests or things about prepositions. We're going to start with the easy ones here, which is uh, the accusative prepositions. These are always accusative. No matter what you do to them, they are always going to be accusative. No exceptions. So, except for that one exception I'm going to get to in a minute, but ignore that. Most of the time, no exceptions. Uh, first example, we have bis. Bis means until. Ona uh, means without, and I don't know what happened to the T at the end of without, but it's without, without. Um, at any rate, ona, without. Für means for. Um means around. Durch means through. Gegen means against. And entlang means along. Now, if you want to have a mnemonic device for this, the reason I put them in this order is because I have the mnemonic device of B.O. Fudge. B.O. Fudge. Uh, if you know anything about the English language, you know that the word uh, B.O. is an abbreviation of body odor. Um, if you have body odor so bad that it kind of like uh, has its own um, substance to the smell, um, that would be B.O. Fudge. So it's body odor that's so bad uh, you you can make fudge out of it. That's awful and sounds really gross because it is, but B.O. Fudge is my uh, <laughs> mnemonic device for using this. Uh, most textbooks don't even bother talking about bis and entlang. Um, in fact, my textbook that I use to teach every day does not use uh, bis and entlang in them at all. It never mentions that they're accusative. Um, and so instead, we usually use foodog uh, as our mnemonic device. Um, F-U-D-O-G, foodog. Um, but that's a different one. Anyway, B.O. fudge is what we're using today. Now, examples of the accusative case. Bis nächsten Donnerstag habe ich viel zu tun. Until next, to, ne, until next Thursday, I have a lot to do. Bis nächsten Donnerstag habe ich viel zu tun. Um, bis is accusative. That's why we have nächsten Donnerstag which is accusative and masculine ending there for the en. Bis next in Donnerstag. Feel is also in the accusative case. It's the thing being uh, had in that sentence, uh, which is why it's accusative as well. Ich gehe nicht, nicht nach draußen ohne meinen Mantel. I am not going outside without my coat. In this sentence here, we have ona, which is without, meinen Mantel, which has an en at the end, because ona requires the direct object or the accusative case, uh, which is ona meinen Mantel, without my coat. Er gibt viel Geld für die Karten aus. He spends a lot of money on the tickets. Uh, for the tickets, für die Karten, uh, is accusative. It doesn't change the, the article here for D. It's uh, still plural, so no ending or no change to that. Uh, für die Karten, accusative case. Mein Vater fährt um die Ecke. My father is driving around the corner. My father is uh, the one driving. Uh, the direction is um die Ecke, around the corner, and um requires the accusative case, so the entire phrase um die Ecke is accusative. Der Rennkuckuck rennt durch den Tunnel. The roadrunner runs through the tunnel. The tunnel is the thing that is in the prepositional phrase here, durch den Tunnel. Uh, durch den Tunnel. 
uh, and therefore here is accusative because durch requires the accusative case, den Tunnel, because it's a masculine noun. Was hast du gegen meinen Bruder? What do you have against my brother? Gegen is against. Meinen Bruder is an en at the end because it's a masculine noun, so we use an en ending. Uh, ich laufe den Strand entlang. I am walking along the beach. That's accusative case. And this is the reason that my textbook never brings up the word entlang. And that's because if you use the word entlang after your prepositional phrase, so we have den Strand, which is the thing that is being kind of connected with entlang in this sentence. I'm walking along the beach. Uh, den Strand, accusative case. If it's used after the, uh, the object of the preposition, it's accusative. However, as uh, Moral Leuven uh, thought it was uh, necessary down there in the comments to point out, uh, it is in fact genitive, genitive, if it is used in front of the object. So even if you rewrite the exact same sentence and say, Ich laufe entlang des Strandes, that's genitive, because you move that preposition to the other side. So, entlang, accusative if it's used after the noun, and if it's used in front of it, it is genitive or genitive. So, example of that, ich laufe entlang des Weges. I am walking along the path. Um, ich laufe entlang des Weges. I am walking along the path. That's genitive. Because you use the preposition entlang in front of the object rather than using it uh, behind it in order to get that accusative case. All right, next up is the most popular concept that everybody keeps asking me to talk about, and that is two-way prepositions. This seems to be incredibly confusing to a lot of English speakers when to use the accusative and when to use the dative case which was, uh, with what's called a Wechselpräposition. Wechselpräpositionen, sind, uh, they are two-way prepositions. Um, that means that this could be accusative or it could be dative. And depending on how it's used in the sentence, um, you could use either one, and that is incredibly confusing. So, generally speaking, uh, we use the, uh, the mnemonic device DLAM, as in DLAMIT. Um, that is D-L-A-M, dative location, accusative motion. This means that if it is stationary and is in one location, not going from one place to another, staying where it is, and it uses one of these prepositions to explain that position, it is dative. If this object that is on or behind or inside of or next to, if it is any of those things that is going towards that position, it is accusative. Now, that seems like an oversimplification because it is. So, for instance, uh, there are certain times that you're going to use a preposition like this that is not going to be a change of any of these things. Um, glauben an, for instance, to believe in. Um, that's going to be a, a thing that we're going to talk about here in a little bit with fixed prepositions. Um, but it's really a change of state or change of location. And so uh, this is sometimes a bit confusing. Um, it's not just a change of location, which is like the movement that most people think. It's also not things like playing. So for instance, if you're playing something, you think you're moving around a lot. You're playing soccer. You're running from one side of the field to the other side of the field. But if you say, um, I am playing soccer on the soccer field, it is auf dem Platz. Auf dem, dative case, because you are playing on top of that field and you never leave that field during the entire game, that is dative, location. If you are running, if you are running on a treadmill, that's dative. You're not going from one place to another. If you run onto the treadmill, you're running from the other side of the treadmill onto it, that's accusative. It's a change of state or a change of location or um, a change from one place or one state of being to another, that's accusative. And that seems to be incredibly confusing to a lot of German learners. There are nine of these prepositions. Um, we have on, which means on. This is generally speaking used for vertical things. I say generally because it's not going to make a whole lot of sense if you try and say that um, you, like, you're, okay, let's say <laughs> you're at a corner of a street. That's not a vertical thing or a horizontal thing. It's a street corner. There's no way to say that that's vertical or horizontal. And yet, for some reason, it uses on. 
So it's really confusing sometimes to differentiate between on and off, but generally speaking, vertical things are gonna use on, like on the wall or on the board or something like that, that's on, as opposed to auf, which is horizontal, things like on the floor, auf dem Boden, or on the table, auf dem Tisch. Um, those are those two ons. Hinter is uh, behind, so if something is going towards behind something, that's accusative. In is in sometimes, but in this case we're talking about into because it's going to be used with motion. And then uh, neben is next to. Then we have über, which is over or above. Unter is under or below. Vor, which is in front of or before. Um, and then zwischen, which is between. All right. Verbs that might be helpful for you to kind of pay attention to whenever you see this, is, these four verbs are very often used with uh, two-way prepositions, and they are always, well, most always, uh, with the exception of hängen, um, they're used with the accusative case. So legen is to lay. If you lay something down somewhere, that's accusative, okay? You are laying that into a different location than where it used to be. That verb uses the accusative case with these prepositions. Stellen does the same thing. You are putting something in a standing position somewhere else. That is accusative case. So I'm putting this onto the table. That is accusative. Setzen requires a direct object. If you are setting something, uh, you can even set yourself down. That's, acu that's accusative for the reflexive there. Ich setze mich. I'm setting myself. But if you are setting yourself onto a chair, ich setze mich auf den Stuhl, accusative case. Hanging is confusing because if it's used with a direct object, I'm hanging something, um, that thing then is used with the accusative case with these two-way prepositions. All right, let's get into some examples. Ich hänge das Bild an die Wand. I am hanging the picture onto the wall. This is accusative because Bild is the thing being hung. That's accusative for the direct object. But an die Wand is also accusative because it's being hung onto the wall. Er legt, er legt das Blatt Papier auf den Tisch. Das Blatt Papier is the accusative object for the direct object. It is being placed onto the table and therefore auf den Tisch, accusative case, because it's being put in a different location than it was before, accusative for motion, auf den Tisch. Der Ball rollt hinter den Kühlschrank. The ball rolls behind the refrigerator. Der Ball rollt hinter den Kühlschrank. It wasn't behind the refrigerator before, but it is now hinter den Kühlschrank, accusative case. Ich springe in das or ins Schwimmbecken. I am jumping into the swimming pool. In das Schwimmbecken, because it is accusative, you're going into it. You weren't in it before, you are now, that's accusative. In das Schwimmbad, uh, Schwimmbecken, in das Schwimmbecken, ins Schwimmbecken. Ich lege das Buch neben die Tasse. I lay the book next to the cup. So you're putting it in a new location that wasn't prior. So neben die Tasse, accusative case. Die Kuh springt über den Mund. Uh, nee, den Mund. Den Mund, not, uh, not over the mouth, but over the, mouth, uh, over the moon. Die Kuh springt über den Mund. The cow jumps over the moon. It wasn't over the moon before, but it's jumping into that position and therefore accusative. Der Ball rollt unter das Sofa. The ball rolls under the sofa. Under the sofa is a new location for the ball. It wasn't there before, but it rolled into that position. And so we have unter das Sofa accusative case. Ich stelle den Spielzeugzug uh, vor das Spielzeugboot. I am placing the toy train in front of the toy boat. Den Spielzeug Zug is accusative because it's the direct object, the thing being placed. To where it is being placed is now accusative as well because vor das Spielzeug, uh, Spielzeugboot 
is accusative, it's being placed into a different position than it was before. Accusative. Er stellt die Vase zwischen die Säulen. He places the vase between the columns. It wasn't there before, it is now. That's a change of place and therefore accusative. Zwischen die Säulen. All right, let's get into something more confusing, and that is fixed prepositions. These are kind of confusing because they don't actually make a whole lot of sense. So sometimes there are verbs that are commonly used with a particular preposition. Um, these are often referred to as fixed uh, prepositions, uh, meaning that they have to be used with this particular verb, which is not the case. You can use these verbs without this, uh, without this preposition at all. Uh, you can even use different prepositions sometimes with different verbs. Um, for instance, the verb glauben, you can say glauben an, glauben uh, für, glauben with uh, different things, but you don't want to use it with, uh, you got to use it with a particular case, and that's what matters here. So. Certain prepositions are used with certain cases, and uh, those ones that we mentioned before, the uh, bo, uh, bio fudge, the bis, ohne, für, um, durch, gegen, and entlang, those accusative prepositions, if they're used with one of these verbs, you have this is in the accusative case, which is pretty obvious. Accusative case is always required. So, er entscheidet sich für die Pizzeria. He decided himself for the pizzeria. Zech is reflexive, and that one's accusative, but for is requiring an accusative as well, die Pizzeria. Wir bitten Sie um Vergebung, we are asking you for forgiveness. Um Vergebung, here is again accusative case because um is accusative. Now where these get confusing is, if you have a two-way preposition, and it's one of these verbs, if you are thinking about something, and you use the preposition an, is that a location or a change of state? No one has any idea. That's not going to make any sense. I think about something, or I think about you, in this case is the accusative case, even though it's a two-way preposition. Um, generally speaking, you're just going to have to memorize which ones take the accusative case and which ones take the dative case. Uh, I've got a link in the description for where you can find a list of these verbs and what uh, prepositions are commonly used with them, but uh, it's yeah, it's really confusing and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But denken an or ich denke an dich, uh, that's accusative case because it just is. Wartest du auf den Bus? Are you waiting on the bus? In this case you have auf den Bus because it's again accusative case. Um, if you're waiting on something or waiting for something, it doesn't make sense that it's either a uh, you know, location or not location, or if it's a change of location, you can't really make that argument here because it doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So, auf den Bus in this case is accusative just because it's being used with the verb warten. More examples of verbs that will do this. There's a link, like I said, to a Wikibooks uh, article in, uh, in which it gives uh, prepositions for all kinds of stuff, but uh, specifically there's a part of there that shows you prepositions that are used with particular verbs, um, and they're commonly used with those verbs. So, denken an is, uh, is a accusative thing, to think about or think of. Sich erinnern an, to remember, um, is also accusative for whatever it is that you're remembering. Uh, glauben an is to believe in, that thing in which you believe is accusative. Sich freuen auf, to look forward to, that's also accusative for whatever it is that to which you are looking forward. Warten auf is accusative for whatever it is that you are waiting for or on. Sorgen für is accusative for whatever it is that you are taking care of, the, the thing that is the object of that preposition. All right, that is the end of this wonderful presentation here about the accusative case. I believe I have covered everything you will ever need to know about the accusative case. You will never have to learn another thing about the accusative case as long as you live because I just taught you everything you will ever need to know about the accusative case in one hour of a live lesson. So. That is all I have for today. Like I said uh, before at the beginning of this whole thing, if you uh, want to, you can send out a, uh, a super chat for $5 or more, and I will send you a copy of this presentation as well as a worksheet uh, to go with this presentation so that you can practice this stuff on your own. And I always make an answer key for my uh, worksheets that I send out there for this. Uh, so you can get the copy of that, you can practice this on your own, and then you can use that same answer key uh, to check your work when you're done. Um, alternatively, you can always email me any questions with uh, regard to my worksheets that I have. Um, 
The option of uh, doing a super chat is one option. Uh, the other option would be to uh, wait a couple of days and I'll have it up on my website as well and you can download it from there I have a, a new tab on there for my shop uh, Where you can download all kinds of worksheets and other materials. I have a section on there just for my live lessons, which uh, you should be able to find uh, just by like hovering over the top of the word uh, shop and it'll give you a drop down there. One of those things is live lessons. And here in a few days, I'll have the, uh, the live lesson for today. I'll have a copy of this, uh, this presentation and a worksheet uh, uploaded there so that you can find that. And that will again be just $5 uh, for anybody who wants that. Uh, again, shout out to my Patreon people. Thank you so much for your support. You guys get this uh, extra materials that go with this presentation for free. So thank you to you guys. 